Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> The Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. To become a member, go to rmef.org. And the podcast is also brought to you by OnX Maps. And with OnX Maps, you can know where you stand with the most accurate hunting GPS tech on the market with land ownership maps that work offline. Go to onxmaps.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 20% when you sign up for an app membership at onxmaps.com. The podcast is also brought to you by Gerber. Uh, go to gerbergear.com and learn about the knives, the vital, the big game vital, the Gator Premium, all the things that we use when we're out in the woods and not just knives, but also some really cool multi-tools that they have. And we have a promo code for Gerber as well. Just use the code ELKTALK to save 20% on your orders at gerbergear.com. And we are also brought to you by Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is the original designer and inventor of the pallet plate diaphragm that's completely changed the way elk calls are made and used. And to find out more and to order your elk calls, go to RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or buglingbull.com and use promo code ELKTALK and you're going to save 15% on all of your elk calls and elk call accessories. The Elk Talk podcast is also brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. The Insider is changing how hunts and hunting information are found. No doubt about that. Use promo code ELKTALK, and when you do, when you sign up for the Insider, you're going to get $50 of store credit, mad money, in their gear shop. Lastly, the University of Elk Hunting online course is a proud partner of the Elk Talk podcast. And within the University of Elk Hunting online course, you're going to find nearly 60 chapters organized in 17 modules of elk hunting instruction aimed at making you a more successful elk hunter. From planning and e-scouting to calling strategies and packing, every imaginable elk hunting topic is included in the online course. And regardless of your previous elk hunting experience or success, I'm confident the University of Elk Hunting online course will make you a more confident, more successful elk hunter. Just visit elk101.com and use the promo code ELKTALK to save 20% when you sign up for a membership to the University of Elk Hunting online course. And with that, Corey... We are ready to get into it. Let's jump into it. Hey, Corey, how's your foot doing? Or your leg? <laughs> it will be good by September. Oh, that's not good. Hey, <laughs> don't don't eat as much ice cream as I've been eating the last two months, and you'll be one of those uh, cool purchase hunters. Shade in the summer I, and warmth in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've uh, I've already started my upper body workout uh transition from doing the full body to upper body but i actually went to the physical therapist today and got some beginner exercises to do and i'll be going to a personal trainer here in the next week or so and i will uh i feel sorry for the elk because i'm going to be stronger and faster by september than i've ever been so oh you'll be like colonel steve austin the six million dollar elk hunter <laughs> 
for all of you. <laughs> I was just going to say, I, I'm even on the tail end of that one. Yeah, there was a there was a TV show in the late '70s called The Six Million Dollar Man, where Colonel Steve Austin was rebuilt, stronger, faster, even better than before. <laughs> Had a bionic guy. They called him the bionic man. Yep. So, yeah, that'll be you. That, well, that's my goal. Well, anyhow, when you t- when you sent me a text and said, "Hey, we got to do this later in the day because I got physical therapy," I'm like, "Huh? I didn't think anything of it." Then I see your Instagram post where your foot like looked like someone ran it over with a John Deere tractor or something. Yeah, it, it felt similar to that when it happened and. For those that weren't following along on my Instagram story when it happened, I've uh, been doing a lot of shed hunting this spring and carrying a lot of weight. And my calf, my left calf, had been for probably a week and a half just tight feeling. So I've been stretching it out and trying to take care of it. We went shed hunting and all day hiking, it was tight. So I stopped a couple times and stretched it. And I even had the thought in my mind, you know, man, this is pulling like on my Achilles area. And Anyway, I towards the end of the day, I was about a mile from the truck and just stepped off a log, and I didn't jump on it awkward or jump off with a lot of weight, just literally stepped on off a log like I've done a million times. And the second my foot hit the ground and my calf muscle contracted, there was a loud snap, and I heard it and felt it and hobbled my way out for a mile with uh, trekking poles, trying to use them as makeshift crutches. But anyway, I went to the doctor the next morning and I ruptured the gastroc muscle, which is the big muscle on the back of your calf. And it's uh, it's the muscle that actually attaches to your Achilles tendon, but I ruptured the muscle and not the tendon. So it's actually about the best case of what it could have been. So no surgery needed, just some rest and ice and elevation and physical therapy and some training. And I would say six to eight weeks, I'll be back to 100%. <laughs> well, now you know why I don't do shed hunting. I guess there's always that way of looking at it. Uh, I was just bummed because I was literally in the probably the best shape I've been in in the spring in quite a while because we had been doing some big hikes and some big weights. And I think uh, the moral of the story is just listen to your body because I, I, I heard it. I just didn't listen to it. And I'm pretty sure if I would have just spent a little time with a foam roller and doing some more direct targeted stretching i'd have been just fine but i pushed it a little bit too hard and here we sit oh. <laughs> oh. i don't know what i'm gonna do with you i'm trying my best but dang. i i i have passion compassion for you i'm worried about you but i'll just i'll eat your extra serving of ice cream then since you can't go exercise for a while <laughs> Oh, I'm exercising. I'm already exercising. So yeah, good thing we're not video doing video of these podcasts. People look at me and say Newberg looks all swelled Uh-oh. up. They're like a wood tech that's been on a bear for about three months. I'm like Randy, the little kid on the Christmas Story who can't put his arms down because the clothes are you got too many clothes on. I can't put my arms down because I've been eating too much ice cream. My jowls are all swelled up. <laughs> Uh, you put on the the quarantine 25 huh yeah it's but for what it's worth it's a 4.4 mile hike to my office where the dilly bars are at well the problem is you've got a freezer full of the dilly bars so (laughs) so it's eight point it's 8.8 round trip according to according to my pedometer and are you you're walking that every day no, not every day. <laughs> Just when I really need a dilly bar. You need a dilly bar. <laughs> my theory is if I put my my treats far enough away that I have to really do something to get one of them, it kind of way you know balances itself out. Interesting. So hopefully, not everybody's gained ten pounds like I have in the last few months. I don't know. Probably eight pounds. It's like, huh, it's not good. So. Man. See, and oh, I put my I put my I treats. I bring them close, and I, my thinking is, if they're close, then I'll eat them all at once yeah. and just get it over with, and then then I don't yep. have them. So I might have yeah. to try that theory. Other than my theory, I'd have like 
I, I could build little, you remember when you were a kid and you built forts out of <laughs> popsicle sticks? I'd have enough billy bar sticks. I could build the, you know, Fort Ticonderoga <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, we, we started this podcast to talk about Idaho applications that are due June 5th, and somehow I got us headed down the wrong path. Well, that's not the first time that's happened when you and I get together and talk. So we'll just... We'll get realigned here and talk about Idaho applications. Yeah. Can can we give the folks an update on our uh, commitment that we would pay the first $20 of their sportsman's app, uh, membership at our MEF? Yeah. That's, uh, that took off like gangbusters. I wasn't expecting that. But, yeah, give them an update. Yeah. I, I could not believe it. Uh, as of yesterday morning, which was the 18th, They'd sold 420 or somewhere near there yeah. of the 500 that we pledged. Yep. So it's awesome. So people better get with the program. By the time this podcast drops, the $20 commitment yep. might be gone. Yeah. Just to recap what it is, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation launched a new membership package that they're calling the Sportsman Membership. And to help launch it, Randy and I thought, well, we'll just we'll offer to pay twenty dollars of that membership for the first five hundred people that sign up, thinking, ah, there probably won't be a hundred people sign up for that from our list of listeners and in the first uh episode, over four hundred listeners have signed up. So if you are wanting to get in on that, it's a hundred dollars a year. Randy and I will pay twenty dollars of that. We also have uh lined up for you to get a Gerber Vital Knife, which is a $40 value. You get all the regular membership perks for being an RMEF member, plus a portion of your membership goes directly to improving or opening access to public land for hunting. So for what we can't afford not yeah, for what we love to do and what we talk about, which is elk hunting on public land, it is uh, it's the membership to be involved with for sure. Yeah, well, I, I was surprised that RMEF tr- trusted us enough that they would allow us to roll it out before it becomes official in July. I suspect they thought, oh, these jokers might sell three or four memberships by July. <laughs> I, I that's what I gave, that's what I gave us credit for. Yeah, me too. And then when, I think. I know I I don't think that, but I I was just about floored when they sent me the email. I'm like, well, guess what, Corey? We better break out the checkbook here. I was just going (laughs) to say the first thing I did was grab the calculator and like, wow. uh, Corey and Randy are finally putting their money where their mouth is. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's a good thing that you get to buy an Idaho resident license because you won't have much left to spend after that pledge we made to RMEF. <laughs> Fortunately, I won't need to. Yeah, the uh, Idaho license is much less for a resident than for a non-resident. Yeah. Do, do you have a lifetime license as residents in Idaho? We have that option. I do not have one. Okay. They're okay. pretty spendy. I am well, when you're like three years old, I think it turns out to be a pretty good deal, but... As an adult okay. buying one, unless you're going to move out of state, I think, you know, if if you're looking at um, buying a resident license while you live here for a lifetime and then move out of state, you still have your license and that's where it would save you. Okay. Well, for a non-resident, it's $154.75 a year plus your online transaction fees, which starts getting you up to about 160 yep. bucks. Yeah. But the good news is, you guys are pretty generous on your elk tags, at least until you decide to raise the fees. You know, and so, yeah, we'll just, before we jump into that, understand that beginning in 2021, uh, Fishing Game has approved an increase in fees for non-resident license and tags, as well as a decrease in the number of tags that are offered. And I haven't seen proposals for those numbers yet to, to know what they are, Um uh, but it's going to make it even more difficult for non-residents to be able to come and hunt. One of the easiest states for a non-resident to come and hunt. So, well, they better take advantage of it this year, then. Yeah, it's, uh, that's. I didn't go that far and say that, but yep, that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what yours truly is doing. I'll be over there uh, elk hunting since uh, since I didn't draw a moose tag last week. 
uh, I guess I'm coming over archery elk hunting. Nice. And I'm going to buy my license before August 1st, which is the date that you residents can pick up all those extra non-resident tags if you pay the non-resident price. Yep. And in the past, it's been really nice because in Idaho, you can buy any leftover non-resident tags. So the state of Idaho sets aside, I want to say it's 14,000. Let me just look here real quick. Uh, total elk tags, 12,815. So that that's set hmm. aside for non-resident quota. And theoretically, there could be 12,815 non-residents in one zone. I mean, theoretically, because not all zones are capped, but there are about 50% of the -the over-the-counter zones that are capped for a non-resident. And those go on sale in December. And for the most part, if you didn't buy one of those in December, you aren't going to be able to get one. There are only three zones where there are actually tags left for those capped units. About 50% of the state is not capped, so the non-residents fall under the total cap, which is the 12,815. On August 1st, if those 12,815 tags haven't all sold, residents can go and buy a second tag by paying the non-resident price. So I can get my regular, uh, what is a resident elk tag in Idaho, $36.75. So I can buy that, and then on August 1st, if there are leftover non-resident tags, as a resident, I can go and buy one of those for $416.75. Dollar cost averaging if you were in the stock market, right? That's right. And so then I've got two elk tags at a cost of $200 each. And (laughs) well, you know, and it's it's yep. kind of and so the the cool thing is you can buy them for the exact same unit in the same hunt. So I could have two archery elk tags for unit A in my pocket at the same time, and I could call in two elk at once and shoot both of them right there on the spot. Or I could get a archery elk tag in unit A and a late season rifle elk tag in unit B. But as a resident, I am also restricted to the non-resident cap on any of those capped zones. So if those capped zones have sold out, I'm stuck to a over-the-counter non-capped zone. Okay. So we might be getting slightly ahead of ourselves, <laughs> but I, just, I, I had in big red letters here on my tablet, do not forget to remind people that you can't take for granted you'll be able to get your Idaho tag late into the summer because as people learned last year, they went online August 5th, and all the tags were gone, and they're belly aching. Well, what's going on? Well, all those smart Idaho residents jumped in there and said, well, I think I'll buy one of these non-resident ones. And boom, they were gone. Yep. And I believe last year was the first time um, that I know of that those non-resident tags sold out before the season opened. Because I was kind of the same. I was like, well, I'm going to go hunt Oregon. And then when we get back, depending on how this, how the hunting in Idaho is going, I'll make a decision of what tag to buy, what non-resident tag. And they were sold out before we even left for Oregon. So, yeah. So if I'm, I'm since I'm a non-resident, I, I get to choose. I can apply for moose or goat or sheep. But if I do any of I can only do one of those. And if I do one of those, I can't apply for the controlled hunts of deer, elk, and antelope. Correct. And if I say, heck with moose, goat, and sheep, I can apply for all three controlled species, hunts for controlled, controlled hunts for species of deer, elk, and antelope. So. Correct. Yep. So So you have to choose, choose to apply for one of the once in a lifetime hunts or big game. Yeah. And I tell people, if you're going to go to Idaho as your fallback over-the-counter hunt, and you've already bought the hunting license, and you've already, you're going to buy the elk tag, you're crazy not to apply for the controlled hunts of deer, elk, and antelope. Because, it, you know, swing for the fences. There's no point system. Yeah, you're subject to the 10% cap as a non-resident, but guess what? Maybe your number comes up, and you'll probably be pretty happy to have that unit I'm not going to say controlled elk tag than probably a general tag. Yep. 
And that's okay. a, and that's exactly what I do. I just put in for some of the premier hunts, knowing my odds are one percent, two percent, somewhere in there. And if I don't draw, no big deal. I've got over the counter tag. And so, like you said, if somebody is planning on hunting Idaho, it does no harm to just apply for a controlled hunt. You might luck out and end up with a really good hunt uh, because there are no point systems or anything. Everybody has that same chance every year. And the uh, cost to apply for each of those hunts is $14.75 for a non-resident or $6.25 for a resident. Yeah. And I mean, if I can't afford $15 to apply for a controlled hunt, the odds are I can't afford the gas to drive to Idaho to do a hunt. <laughs> or the $600 it's going to cost you for the license and a tag for over-the-counter as a non-resident. Right. Yeah, by the time you add all the transaction fee and internet fee and everything, it's getting just under $600 for the license yep. plus the out tag. Which we here in Montana need to teach you guys how to lay the leather to folks. No teach kidding. Them how to write a check yeah, for I mean, Under $600 yeah, right. for a license and a tag for Idaho and go to Montana and you're up into four digits pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. But we give long seasons, you know, if we get any kinder to non-residents, <laughs> we'll probably die of enlargement of the heart. I do have to give Montana credit. I was able to finally fire my attorney because they've made it a little bit easier to navigate how to apply in Montana. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh dang! So all the out of state attorneys know they're they're taking it on the shorts or in the shorts now that Montana tried to simplify their process a little bit. You know, only half the people need an attorney to. Well, I think all the people still need an attorney. We only need half as many attorneys, which I don't need two anymore. I just need one. Oh, okay. Uh, So back to Idaho elk hunting. You, when when you do this uh, as a non-resident like I am, since I applied for moose, I can't apply for a controlled hunt. But my crew, they're all applying for controlled hunts, and they are subject to a ten percent cap. Uh, correct, which, and it's a cap, not a not a set aside. So non-residents can right. draw no more than ten percent, but they might actually draw zero. They're just put in the same pool with residents, and once non-residents have taking up 10%, no more non-residents will draw a tag for that hunt. But if there are 100 tags and the first 100 people that come out of the hat are residents, then non-residents might draw zero tags for that hunt. Yep. Kind of like Montana and Arizona. Uh, it's an up to 10%. Like Corey said, there's not a set-aside pool yep. of tags. So. <laughs> no point system. Uh, Boy, no we're, just, we're way behind the times here Ooh. in Idaho. We gotta, we should all probably right. talk to somebody about getting a point system to catch up with all the other states. Yeah, before you do that, let me come and threaten bodily harm upon whoever might have that crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be somebody every year that has that crazy idea, and we go rounds of trying to get the word out to what your odds really are with the point system and all the negative downside of it. And still we have, we even have legislators that will not listen to mathematical equations of what your odds really are. They just, their heads in the sand and they think with a bonus point system, me and all my buddies, we're going to be guaranteed to draw the best tag in the state. And that's all we really care about. Yeah. Well, you guys, your deadline is June 5th, and your results, they say the results come out July 10th, but you guys are always earlier than that. They've always come out before the end of June. Now that I say that, they'll make a liar of me. No, it's usually about two to three weeks. So, yeah, that June 20th to 25th time frame, usually they've yeah. got the results out. So, And when it comes out, that's when you hear all the belly aching. We need a point system. <laughs> I've been putting in for the same hunt for 37 years. Me, my uncle, my grandma, my four children, all of us have been putting in for 30-some years, and we've never drawn a tag once. Yep. Yeah. That is a very common story. Yeah. And uh, so that's when people start making the demand for a point system. Same happens in New Mexico where there's no point system. Same thing happens for residents of Wyoming where there's no point system. 
And I get why states started point systems. I sat on Montana's committee that developed our point system. And obviously I was in the minority. Uh, I think I, (laughs) every motion I put forth got killed. Uh, But part of that was I, I was the youngest guy in the room by a mile. I was 35 years old. And now I can say this because I'm an old gray haired fart. All the old gray haired farts, it was point systems weren't about building a bigger pie. It was saying, let's assume the pie is going to stay the same or shrink. How do I make sure that us old gray haired farts get a bigger piece of the pie? That's really how the point system committee I sat on, that's that was the motive. Uh I know that sounds rather uh, accusatory, <laughs> but <laughs> just the reality of it. And if, like in Montana, we didn't stack the deck good enough in favor of the old gray haired guys. So about five or six years ago, a bunch of those older and gray haired guys convinced the legislature to square our points. Which, you know, once you start down that path, and I, I get why a lot of states started down that path. And at the time, a lot of it seemed like a good idea or seemed fair or whatever. But uh, it really creates a point of no return. I don't know how you get out of it once you get in it. And for states that aren't in it, my <laughs> my suggestion would be look closely at other states. Because you might think you're solving a problem, but in a lot of ways, you're creating even more problems. Yep. No, and I just, our argument has always been every year, what, what's the benefit of a point system? And, you know, the, the people who don't understand point systems are, I'll be able to draw this tag I've been putting in for for 20 years. I'll be able to draw it someday and know that I'm going to be able to go hunt that. Okay, well, if we're saying that, then you're talking preference points because with bonus points, you still don't have that guarantee. So they're talking preference points at that point. And at that point, you're looking at it saying this is a very selfish motivation because you're only thinking about yourself knowing that you can get in at the ground level and be a max point holder. And yes, someday, if you get in at ground level, if you are a max point holder, someday you might get to draw a tag. But it's going to absolutely punish anyone who comes in behind you. And, you know, as sportsmen, we have to be aware of what happens down the road, not just ourselves at the front of the line. And it just, it devastates the chances of anybody else ever drawing that tag. And I think that's an important differentiation is to talk about the differences, although they end up the same, the differences between bonus points and preference points when we're talking those systems and how they would affect the outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm an elk hunter from Montana, wherever it might be. I want to come to Idaho. I get my tag. I'm all excited because I've already bought my license when I applied for the controlled hunts. I want to come archery hunting. And if I don't have any luck in archery season, I want to find a place where I can come and rifle hunt maybe for a few days after that. Is that possible in Idaho? Uh, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> that sounds like an answer to something in the tax code, Corey. <laughs> I actually stole that from Michael Jordan. I was watching the last dance with Michael Jordan, oh. episode 10 last night, which it's kind of, it's sad. Yeah. Like I almost, I'm, I'm reliving Michael Jordan's retirement all over again. And of course I was in the prime of basketball when he retired and, and all that, but he was. Uh, he had some headphones in, and reporters were following him, and they were just asking him questions as if he was listening to him. And he just kept rattling off, "Yes, no, maybe. I don't know what you just asked me." And another reporter just asked him another question. He's like, "Yes, no, maybe. That's probably the answer to that question too." And I mean, just you know, wasn't even listening. So that's I stole it from watching that. But if uh, depending on which zone you hunt, each zone has a different structure and idaho is structured into a tags and b tags and most zones have both a tags and b tags and you choose which tag you want to purchase and for the most part the a tag is more weighted towards archery and the b tag is more 
weighted toward rifle. So, for instance, there might be unit A. Okay. Uh, I won't use A. Unit 1. And 1, I'm just using this as a number. There is actually unit 1, but I don't know anything about it, so I'm just making this all up. But unit 1 could have an A tag and a B tag. And unit 1's A tag will allow you to hunt antlerless and antlered elk August 30th through September 30th. And if archery season. And if you buy that A tag, you also, if you don't fill your tag during archery season, could go and hunt spike elk from October 5th through October 14th with a rifle. And then if you buy the B tag, okay. you can hunt antlerless mm-hmm. elk only from August 30th through September 14th. You can hunt antlered only elk from October 10th through October 31st. And you could hunt cow elk with a muzzleloader from November 10th through November 24th. So your primary, your primary hunt is going to be that rifle hunt. But mm-hmm. it also allows you to get out in the woods during archery season. And if you get an opportunity or want an opportunity to shoot cow elk, that's also included on that tag. And then if you don't kill a bull during the rifle season and you want a muzzleloader hunt, you can go back to that same unit in November and hunt with a muzzleloader. And this is all completely theoretical. There are some units that follow a very similar model to that. The dates might change, um, but that's how Idaho has structured their units. You have to kind of, you don't have to, you know, pick a weapon necessarily, but you have to pick what's going to be kind of your primary focus when it comes to a weapon in a season. Okay. So I'm coming over archery hunting in September, so I'm buying an A-tag, a type A, because out there, I'm not going to have a chance to come back in rifle season. Now, if it was a different year when my September is crammed and full, I'd probably buy one of the general type B tags. Is that what you're telling me? Correct. But each, you have to look at each zone. You have to pick your zone first and then determine what season you want to hunt because unit one sits right next to unit two but they might have completely different seasons and opportunities for A and B tags, or one of them might not have a B tag. It might be over-the-counter A tag for archery, but it might be a controlled hunt, even for residents, to go and hunt it with a rifle. Gotcha. So, point of warning, just like in Montana's got a lot of that similar stuff, so does Wyoming, Colorado. Don't think that every unit is cookie cutter. Or you got to go and read the regulations of what season dates, weapon types, uh, allowed harvest by species, by uh, male or female. You got to do that for each unit you might be hunting. Yep. Otherwise, you're going to show up disappointed because you bought the wrong tag for the time you wanted to hunt in the wrong yep. place. Happens every year. <laughs> doesn't it it does yeah and that's you know it's i give montana a bad time for being complicated montana is complicated to figure out how to apply and and do some of that but idaho is somewhat complicated as well because of the way they've structured their management it's all about management they've looked at okay this herd of elk ranges from this mountain range they winter down here We've got to structure this zone so that we can focus on this herd of elk, so that we know how many elk are wintering, so they aren't merging necessarily with another herd from another zone, and it gives us skewed numbers if we do our counts in the you know winter or spring. And so there is a there is a scientific madness to uh, what they do, but it makes it really confusing for somebody that looks at a map of Idaho and there's all these lines and numbers everywhere. And you've got to pick a spot, and then you've got to pick a season, and then that might dictate what weapon you're using. And you decide, do all this research, and you decide you don't want to hunt there, so you go 20 miles down the road to a different zone, and all of a sudden there's no archery season, or the archery season there is antlerless only. And so it's, yeah, you have to be very specific and know the specific opportunities within each zone. Cool. So if I'm coming archery hunting, i got to buy an archery validation Stamp, is that what it is? If you're going to hunt during an archery-only season, so if you wanted to hunt bears in the spring with your bow, it's just a general season. You can hunt with any weapon you want. You don't need an archery validation or an archery stamp. 
if okay. you want to hunt an archery only season. So September for elk, there is archery only season. Then you have to have taken a archer, uh, was archery education, I think they call it, uh, archery education yep. course, passed it and purchased an archery stamp in order to hunt in Idaho during an archery only season. Yeah. Don't forget about that because people show up to buy their archery stamps. Montana has the same rule and they have not taken uh, archery or bow hunter education, whatever you want to call it. And they're like, what do you mean? Because a lot of the states in the Midwest and the East and the Southeast don't require that for archery hunting. So they get out here and they don't have their stamp and they can't get their stamp. Uh, I don't know how it is in Idaho, but in Montana, if you can show proof of having an archery tag in another state, that serves as a replacement or a substitute for taking the class. Correct. Yep. Okay. And that's 20 bucks for a non-resident and nineteen dollars and fifty cents for a resident what you residents just couldn't cough up that extra fifty cents or what's the deal <laughs> you know, gonna break you guys you can't you can't buy more moose or something because of that fifty cent different i don't know i just don't get the fifty cents and the seventy five cents and the sixteen dollars and seventeen cents you know i just I'm one of those simple guys. Tell me it's a twenty dollar bill I'd rather pay twenty dollars yeah. than sixteen dollars and seventy five cents it's just easier in my math and I, I think you guys got too many accountants working for your game and fish agency there. <laughs> i think somebody watched a youtube video on how to deceptively market and like oh if somebody's not willing to pay 17 dollars, they'll pay 16 dollars and 95 cents so we'll charge them 16 dollars yeah. and 75 cents so if someone draws a controlled tag which i don't ever seem to have to worry about this in idaho with these moose tags that i apply for uh, you have to purchase that before August 1st, right? Correct. They don't mail it to you. So if you luck out and you draw a controlled permit, don't sit around looking in your mailbox. Get online and pay for the darn thing. Yep. They'll send you a postcard and say you were successful, but now you have to purchase it. Yep. So yeah, you've you've drawn the opportunity to purchase a tag is what you've drawn. Yeah. And if you don't, they take your tag and they put it in the second draw. <laughs> and suckers like me apply again to try to get some of those tags in the second draw. Yeah. Let's see, that second draw is usually August 15th, I think, is the deadline for that, of all the unclaimed tags. Yeah, and it's so goofy because you've got antelope hunts that open on August 15th, and they, you know, they aren't even doing the draw and letting you know until August 18th or whatever. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some changes coming to that. Um, in fact, okay. I was just looking here really quickly because I wanted to say there was a change this year. You you keep talking here, and I will. Uh, I'm going to look that up because okay. I think that we might have changed that this year. Okay. Well, a couple things in Idaho. I know you don't have in rifle seasons. You don't have the hunter orange requirement. Um, I know that hunter safety is required. Uh, if you are born after January 1st, 1975, so being the old fogey I am, I'm exempt from that, even though I have hunter certificate, hunter safety certificate. Um, oh, and then you guys got this weird rule about, it, it's kind of interesting, rather than, uh, maybe this is a derivative to address some of the concerns that point systems are always set up for is that if you draw a controlled hunt for deer or elk, you can't apply the next year for that same controlled hunt or is it for an antlered? So if you draw an antlered controlled hunt, the next year you can't apply for an antlered controlled hunt or something like that. Anyhow, uh, you're, you're asking detailed questions. I know there is a one-year wait if you if you draw a controlled hunt. Um, just looking here. If you draw a controlled hunt for deer or elk, you cannot apply again for one year, excluding leftover controlled hunt tags and landowner okay. tags. So it's not just for right. antlered. And for the archery hunter, you guys don't allow lighted knocks or mechanical broadheads, correct? 
<laughs> <laughs> just came out today that the Fish and Game Commission voted to not allow lighted knocks again. There was a petition signed and a proposal to allow lighted knocks in Idaho. And the Fish and Game Commission just this week denied that petition. Um, and I, you know, having been through this several times over the last 20 plus years in Idaho for technological advancements, I see their point and I agree with their decision because of the outcome that will come if it was implemented. And they've just said in Idaho, you know, for instance, muzzleloaders, it has to be the old flintlock style, can't be um, rear loading, just all these things to make it traditional. Um, for archery, they don't allow anything battery operated to be attached to your weapon. So no video camera on your stabilizer, no lighted knocks, no lights on your sights on the front of your bow, things like that. And you think about something like a lighted knock. And a lighted knock is not going to increase anyone's success. It will help you maybe find more animals. If you were to shoot one, you'll know where you hit, or you might be able to see the elk as it runs across the hillside and beds down. Uh, things like that. It will improve this, the recovery rates of, of animals. But, and I think Fishing Game fully recognizes that, but they also recognize it's a slippery slope. And once you allow for that, your argument of no electronic devices or no battery operated devices attached to a weapon is no longer valid. Now you've got to come up with a justification for each and every restriction. And as more of those things get petitioned and added in and success rates do go up, we lose opportunity. They'll shorten the seasons. They will move the archery hunt out of the peak of the rut. And so while I fully would support having lighted knocks from the standpoint of it's not going to increase our success rates and it's going to help our recovery rates go up, the slippery slope it creates is we will lose opportunity in the future. And I, I would much rather not have a lighted knock and keep my opportunity than be able to see where my arrow hits and know that I'm going to lose opportunity. Yeah. Um I think you got a very valid point there. I mean, the idea behind archery and muzzleloader seasons were quote unquote primitive seasons. And I look at what some of these states allow. Uh, it's not that primitive anymore. And <laughs> having said that, I fully expect we're going to get all these emails. Rah, 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 rah. Okay, whatever. Take a number and stand in line. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, you guys have a ton of public land in Idaho, Corey. I'm trying to remember what it is, like 65% or something of your state is public land? It's a lot. I want to say we have more contiguous wilderness than all the other states except maybe Alaska. And, yeah, percentage yeah. of public land is very high, and especially in the areas where there are elk. That's good. That, that's all good. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, you, you really don't have to worry. There are a few units that border agricultural areas, um, and there are elk in those areas for sure. But for the most part, if you're wanting to go elk hunting, you really don't even have to look at the percentage of public land in most units. And I say most because there are a couple that can get a little yeah. bit tricky. Well, I think that kind of covers yeah. most of Idaho, doesn't it? Don't miss the, if you want to do controlled hunts, don't miss the June 5th deadline. If you plan on going there, make sure you get your over-the-counter tag before they all sell out, which at an absolute minimum is before August 1st. They might even sell out sooner. You never know. So he who hesitates is lost. <laughs> but uh, with, with Idaho taking care of, can I, can I go on a tangent here? I think I know where you're going, but yes, you can. All right. So it's draw results came out last week. We got Utah draw results. We got Montana moose, goat, and sheep. Uh, I think on Friday, was it? We got Idaho once in a lifetime. So you start when all these draw result things start coming out, and this is a little bit of circling back to Idaho not having a point system. Just because I know we're going to have all the whining and wailing and gnashing of teeth for calls that I want a 
preference point system. I just went out and did, this is the accountant in me, okay? So bear with me. I went out and looked at states that they don't even have a full preference point system like Colorado does. I went to Wyoming where 75% of the non-resident tags are on a preference point and 25% are random. And then I went to Utah where it's 50-50, where 50% are on a preference equivalent to a preference point system and the other half are on a bonus point system and i just walked through how point creep is happening for those uh, and i'm guilty of it i look at the draw odds and how many points it took last year i'm like all right finally i caught up this is my year and i jump in and i don't draw and i complain (laughs) oh damn point creep point creep well If people knew how many folks are just buying points, standing on the sidelines in these states with preference point systems, they would understand that point creep is not only a reality of what you accept when you jump jump into these point systems, but it's going to get worse. Just if, if nobody else entered the system today, point creep's going to get worse until we plow through these folks like me who've been in these systems for 25 years. It's just how it is. And uh, I'll use Wyoming, for example. Last year, there were going into the draw in 2019, there were a little more than 1,500 folks with maximum elk points, non-residents. Of that 1,500, and this is just the max point layer, not the – one, you know, the people one, two, or three still at high points, but one, two, or three behind max points. Of that 1,500, only 133 of them actually drew a tag. 399 applied but didn't draw a tag. And this, I'm just talking about the max point layer of people. 399 applied but didn't draw a tag. 982 of them just bought a point. So there's 982 max point holders in Wyoming just waiting for that time when you think, ah, oh, this is my year. I'm going to draw this tag in unit, whatever. One of these 982 people are going to jump in in front of you. And so going into the 2020 draw, and we find out the results here in a couple days, there's 1,381 remaining max point holders. And so the 133 who drew last year, that, that accounts for even an extrapolation that uh, 25% probably drew in the random draw because 25% of the tags are in the random draw. So the number that actually drew in the preference point draw was like 102 or 103, something like that, 105. So... You say, all right, across the board, say 130 people a year, match point holders are drawing in Wyoming. You know how many years it's going to take just to plow through that match point level that's sitting there right now? (laughs) Seven point years. If everyone applies, yeah. Right. And then you look at the layer behind the match point holders. So they're one point behind max. That layer is almost a hundred more people than the max point holders. It's going to take, if you use these numbers of what it was last year, it's going to take another eight years to plow through that layer. So these people at the high levels are applying for these really hard to draw tags. I mean, the, you know, the ones that are the glory tags. My point is if you enter this system with the intention of one of these glory tags, there are so many people in front of you. The likelihood is you're in a preference point system. You're never going to draw in the preference point round. Your only chance in a state like Wyoming is going to be in those random draws where 25% of the tags go randomly. And there it's really, really low chances. Yeah, and I can talk more on the on the bonus point side, you know, those random draw side. But just to further drive home your point of what point creep really is, last year the max points in Wyoming was 14 for elk. Is that correct? 
Uh, last year was 13. Going into it this year is 14. So going in this year is 14. Yep. So you said it would take seven and a half years, eight years to get through all of those people who have max points? Yep, seven points. So in seven or, eight, seven or eight years, it's not going to be 14 points. It's going to go up because all those max point holders from last year now have 14. Next year, they'll have 15. So in seven years, they're going to have 21 points. And then we get to go down to the next level, which is at 20 points. And it's going to take eight years for those people to get sorted through. So now we're at 28 points, max points. So you have to have 28 points in order to draw before somebody with 12 points right now has a chance to draw. So if somebody's sitting on 11 points last year, going into this year, they have 12. They're not even going to have a chance of drawing that tag for 15 years. And in 15 years, they're going to have to wait probably, there'll be nine years that those people are spread out across there. We're going to be up in the 30s for somebody who has 12 points or 11 points right now to be guaranteed to draw in that preference point. So somebody coming in with one point, I mean, you're looking at 190 years to be guaranteed to draw one of those tags, which, you know, there's been a lot of advancements in anti-aging and everything so it may be worthwhile to start applying for that hunt now and maybe you'll live to be 240 and you'll have a chance to hunt yeah i i did I, to your point i i carried this out to the one point holders the people at one point right now and we know that not everyone's going to hold out for just these glory units okay some a lot of people are like you know what I'm just, and once I get to four points, I'm just looking to burn them and I'm recycling through the system. I don't care what unit it is. There's a lot of people like that. But if everybody in the system wanted these glory tags, I calculated that before we burn through the point layers of the two to 14 point folks, so that we then get to the one point folks, take 585 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay so we haven't come that far on anti-aging yet so yeah no. don't don't apply if you're hoping to draw one of those tags how old was noah when he built the ark like 600 or something like that yeah i so, mean we're talking noah, noah age yeah <laughs> and i guess i mean if he was fit enough to build the ark he probably was fit enough to go elk hunting so probably so there right now there's a hundred and three thousand non-residents in wyoming's point system wow. non-residents 103,528 going into this year. And you know what's really going to stink about all this is next year when they reduce the number of non-resident tags that they give out, it's just going to compound yeah. what we've just talked about. Yeah, and this assumes that Wyoming keeps at the 16% threshold for non-residents yeah. for limited entry tags, not, not down to the 10% like has been proposed at times. My point of this illustration is... Point creep is a reality of preference point systems, whether it's Wyoming for non-residents. And uh, I'm looking at uh, Utah. Utah had 15,000 people who did nothing but buy points for elk. Those people are all waiting to jump in line in front of you when your time comes. Yeah, so when you look at draw odds right now and they say we give 10 tags and there's 100 people that put in this year, they're neglecting those 15,000 people who at any point could jump into any of these hunts as an applicant and completely skew the those odds. Yes, and so point creep is a reality. And this is, my, this is the, what I'm trying to get across is don't act surprised when point creep happens. Because if nobody else got into the system today, if they said, you know what, we're done. If you weren't in these non-resident point systems as of 2020, heck with you, you're never getting in. There is going to be point creep in these systems for the next 50 to 70 years. Yep. And so to give people some, some ranges of, of reference of years. So I went through and did a similar thing for Utah. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to use the 15 point level in Utah because Utah's non resident or uh, bonus point preference point system has been around for 26 years. I thought, okay, if you've been in it 15 years, you've been in a pretty long time. I mean, you've made an investment already of, you know, 
over a thousand dollars, probably well over a thousand of license fees and tag application fees. So I'm like, all right, 2019, you go into the draw, you've got, you're at this 15 point level and you're like, well, maybe this is my year. Well, not really, because here's what happened. You had 1,194 people with more points than you who actually applied for the tag. And only 85 of them drew. So that means you still have 1,109 of those people ahead of you (laughs) who were unsuccessful applicants. And unfortunately, there were another 818 who were just buying points who have more points than you. So if your strategy is that you're going to hang out until you draw one of their bonus permits in the preference point side of their draw, and you're at 15 points, and assuming that 2019 is somewhat representative of how many people will draw in those point pools ahead of you, the odds are they're not going to get to your point layer until 2040. You got you're you're already at fifteen. You got twenty more years before you're at you and your layer of point holders are at the top of the pool. Yeah, but in Utah, fifty percent of the tags go to that preference point line, but then they set aside fifty percent for the bonus pool. So everybody has a chance. So everyone has a chance chance because that's a true bonus. And you know, you look at that and it's like what are your chances really in that level? Because, you know, you, you yeah. think, okay, I'm not going to get the max point tag, but I could draw one of those bonus yeah. tags, one of those bonus point tags, because everybody has the same chance. So that's actually, you know, in Idaho, kind yeah. of that's what's been proposed in the past. And everybody argues that, you know, it's not fair that I have to wait so long to draw a tag. Well, actually, that's what makes it fair is that everybody has the same opportunity. I mean, that is the definition of fair, everyone having that same opportunity. And so I ran numbers on multiple units in Idaho when we were doing our study and proposals and why we didn't want to have a point system. But if you take a a unit that has, say, a 10% draw odd, so they give out 80 tags and there's 800 people that apply. If you and I are applying for hunt, we think yep. 10% draw odds, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, I would say that's a fairly realistic hunt to put in for and hope to draw, realizing that only one out of 10 people are going to draw it. But mm-hmm. you and I have both drawn hunts that are 2 3% draw odds before. So if you take that, and this is, again, assuming no yep. new applicants come in when we start a system, the number of applicants does not increase each year. It stays the same each year. And that your bonus points are just strictly weighted by how many chances. So if you have two bonus points, you get two chances in the hat. If you have 10, you get 10 names in the hat. And looking at those draw odds. So your first year, all 800 people put in. They have max points. They have their one point. We give out 80 tags. They have a 10% chance of drawing. At year two, there are now 720 people left that have max points, which is two. We assume 80 people apply at the entry level, so there's still 800 people applying. Now your chances have gone up from 10% to 10.53% as a max point holder. Somebody getting gaining that that one point. So the the real struggle is that person who just turned old enough to start hunting that year, they put in at one point, their odds, instead of being 10%, which they are when it's just completely random, their odds are now 5.26%. So they've been penalized by 50% so that the max point holders can gain 0.53%. When we get to year five. Okay, year five. Year year, year five. I've already calculated this out. You must be an engineer. Uh, I've got a spreadsheet here that's got just about every unit in Idaho and looking at where the cutoff is, where bonus points would make sense. And so this 10% hunt, year five. If you are one of the max point holders, there are 559 of you still left year five because a percentage of you have drawn out over the previous four years. 
you will have an 11.35% chance of drawing that tag. So you've gone from 10% to 11.35% by being a max point holder for five years. The new person who comes in with one point has been penalized from the 10% they started with to now just having a 2.27% chance of drawing that tag. Wow. So my argument was always, how are we going to increase recruitment? How are we going to get youth excited when they come in and look at every single draw out there and realize their chances are negligible? Yeah, they can certainly draw. And every year that happens in in these states that have a bonus point system. But it's really discouraging. It gets even worse. So if you look at a hunt that has a 3% draw odd, say there's 15 tags and 500 people put in, that gives you your 3% draw odd. Year one, everybody has 3%. Year two, you're up to 3.05%. I'll save you boredom of all the details, but if you go to year 10 in that hunt, there are still 374 people with max points so who now have 10. We started with 500. Your odds of drawing that tag in a bonus point yep. system are 3.45. 10 years ago, it was 3%. It's now 3.45. Somebody coming in, somebody coming in ground level on year 10, 0.35%. They've been penalized almost 90% so that we can gain a 0.5% chance over 10 years. Yeah. It just the math doesn't work, and it doesn't support it. Then part of the reason, Corey, that I pick uh, Utah elk and Wyoming elk is one. This is the Elk Talk podcast. If I would have picked Wyoming pronghorn, those they plow through that. They you know they <laughs> through that quite regularly because they give away enough tags. So. Yep. In that instance, you don't end up with – you still end up with some point creep because you have a ton of people in the antelope and deer side of Wyoming on the sidelines buying points, buying points, and whoop, they jump in. But they're plowing people through that system you know, with some variability based on tag numbers that are a function mostly of winter kill. In, in a system where your draw odds are on average 25 to 30%, it's it's working pretty good there, but on uh, on a system where you know Wyoming elk for the max point holders, a hundred and thirty three people out of five hundred and thirty two is all who drew at the max points level. That's not enough of a draw of a percentage draw odds across the board for the system to work as the way most people think a preference point system should work in their minds. And that was part of my reasoning for doing this massive spreadsheet I did was to find where that draw odd level is where a point system would make sense. And again, with a bonus point, you're never guaranteed. So in the models I ran, even with a 33% draw odd hunt, so one in three people right now draw it with, with no point system, add a point system to it, and it works for exactly what you said. It rotates through the people rapidly enough that it makes sense. It gets new people into it, and it churns people through. But in a bonus point system, the model I ran after 10 years, there would still be a handful of mm-hmm. people who have been putting in for 10 years who have 10 points and still did not draw that hunt. So it's it's not a cure-all. Yep. It does give better odds, but about 33% is where that where it switches over and it starts making sense. Anything that's harder to draw than 33% doesn't make sense for points. Yeah, uh, that's kind of my experience. And I I mean, point systems are a reality. We're, they're out there. We're going to have to deal with them. And the more you know about them, the better you understand odds and all that and can predict what behavior patterns there are of applicants. You might be increasing your chances from 12% to 14%, <laughs> which over a long enough time might get you an extra tag or two along the way. But yeah. you're also counting on being lucky. You know, if, if the draw odds are 10%, that means 9 out of 10 people didn't draw. <laughs> you're hoping you're just that lucky guy. Let's face it. Some of us have this habit of being luckier than the other guy and some of us have a habit of just being so unlucky you can't you just can't even justify how that person can be that unlucky 
That yeah. is another factor involved. And we're just talking about getting the tag here. Then we're going to talk about success rates, you know, being 10%. That means nine out of 10 hunters who get the tag don't even fill it. And so, yeah, you're, you're yeah. still counting on luck. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if uh, this is just for the final illustration of the, the Utah system. So I, I said, all right, let's take the pool of 20 people with 26 to 16 points. Okay, they're ahead of the 15-point holders. Then I took just the next five years from 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 and said, how long would it take before the 10-point level folks are in the running? Well, in 2059, 39 years from now, those who have 10 points today, so they'll have 49 points in that year, (laughs) will have a 6% chance of drawing. At some point, we'll point creep. So, if, if I just wonder, at some point, will point creep actually start tapering off when people with all these points start dying? What's that? <laughs> that I, that's I, I'm thinking younger folks are probably listening <laughs> to this saying, "Well, Newberg, why don't you just tip over and get the hell out of the way here, man? You're, you're taking up oxygen." <laughs> But uh, no, I'm sure there will be attrition like that. You know, people lose interest, their health or whatever. Uh, I, I'm just as a, I said, with a, a snapshot of how it was in 2019, if we project that through and extrapolate it, that's what it would be. And my whole point of this is to say that preference point systems and even bonus points to some degree, you're going to have point creep just because of how many people are in the system right now. When Wyoming has 103,000 people in the system, and at every point layer above 10, there's more than 1,500 people, or, you know, between, let's say, between 10 and 14 points, every one of those layers has, at the lowest end, 1,300 and some people, at the highest end, almost 2,500 people, that's an awful lot of people that are just sitting on the sideline waiting to jump in and buy a tag. <laughs> yeah. And if no other people entered the system today, we're going to have point creep for a long time. That's another assumption you know, on the bonus point model for like New Mexico and Idaho who don't have a system. If we look at there's 500 people applying for this unit this year, the models have shown that in the states, when the yeah. year that they implement a bonus point or a preference point system, the number of applicants goes up by anywhere from 35 to over 50 percent. So now, you know, we're looking at my odds of drawing this hunt are 10 percent. You can in just yeah. literally That's count because- on that going down to six or seven percent. And keep in mind on that 10 percent hunt, you've only gained 1.35 percent after five years. So your odds are really going to be 7 or 8% after five years. Right now, without a system, they're at 10%. So keep, keep what you have. Do not try to get points in Idaho and New Mexico. It will bite you, and you will not have an advantage. Yes, and the same goes for Wyoming residents. Yep. And for all the other places where we all are in these point systems, have a reasonable expectation based on a better look at who's standing on the sidelines with more points than you and be like I am with Wyoming pronghorn. I don't see myself ever having more than four pronghorn points in Wyoming. I, I just want to go this year. I burned my three Colorado elk points because it's a full preference point system. I am not going to live long enough to burn a lot of points again in Colorado on a above average unit. So my expectation is I'm just going to churn these points every three or four years. And it results in a whole lot less frustration. My expectations are set a little more reasonable. And I'm going to go hunting a lot more. So, And potentially have a a higher quality hunt in those controlled hunts that are easier to draw than you might have in an over-the-counter unit. Yep, that's really what I'm looking at. So it's a reality we're faced with. How do we deal with it? And I, I've heard like you, Corey, I, before Go Hunt came along, I had these spreadsheets till the end of time, man. I'm like the Charlie Daniels of Excel. I mean, I even knew spreadsheets back when it was Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Quattro Pro. 
Huh? So you're, you're speaking you another language. Micro Pro? No. No. Oh. Everything. It was the rage of the spreadsheet world. Oh, it's going to take over Lotus 1, 2, 3. And most people today, they think like Lotus 1, 2, 3. What's that? I heard of a Lexus. That's a car. Lotus? <laughs> Anyhow, along comes Microsoft Excel in about 95 and eventually gets rid of Lotus 1, 2, 3 and Quattro Pro. So just, so that's how long I've been doing these spreadsheets. Just as you were talking to me, I thought I didn't even realize there was anything before Excel. Excel was released. <laughs> it was released by Microsoft for the Macintosh in September of 1985. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so you are, uh, you're dating yourself there that you were using whatever those other words you were using were. Yeah, Lotus. Lotus. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, point of all this is I've been doing this for a long time, and I've always tried to track how many people are on the sidelines. And that is kind of what set my expectations. And I'll, I'll use an example this year. My son, Matthew, has a ton of Utah elk points. And I'm looking, I'm like, all right, in this unit, this would be his year. Fingers crossed that nobody with more points jumps in and grabs the one bonus tag. <laughs> no more and with more points than him, and we'll see when the when Utah rolls out those big charts of how many drew each hunt code at each point level. Obviously, someone jumped in in front of him, and then the one tag in the bonus random draw, he didn't get. So I just I knew there was a good chance that someone else would look at last year's numbers and say, "Huh, this is my year. I could draw that tag." And that's what happened. And, you know, I guess I could have been all mad about it, but I looked at it and said, "There's a pretty good chance someone else is going to see that." <laughs> guess what, Matthew? Don't put this on your calendar that you're going elk hunting in Utah this year. Uh, so it's all about uh, one of my. Uh, coaches in life has told me that frustration is the result of uh bad expectations so <laughs> and i think that about the point creep if you have unrealistic expectations and you're only looking at one part of the puzzle and ignoring all the people on the sidelines buying points you're going to get frustrated because your expectations were based on something that's not the full picture man it sounds just like a college roommate i had Oh, really? Always, oh. Yeah, he always said, if you set your standards low enough, you'll never be disappointed. <laughs> oh, that must have been what my wife said, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, Corey, I, I, not only have we covered Idaho, but we've just about wore out these soap boxes we're standing on here. But and I, I do it not because I'm... I'm I'm saying that you get rid of point systems. That is not going to happen. Nope. It, it's what states are vested in. There's no way they're going to. They change them. They tweak them every, if, you know. They, and they're, they're, this would be another thing if my 25 years of applying in all these states for all these systems taught me anything. It's what you're buying today is not what it's going to be 10 years from now. Nope. There's going to be some tweak, some change, some allocation percentages, some squaring of this, some gray-haired Finlanders from Bozeman get preference or, <laughs> you know, come up with some sort of crazy thing that you never saw coming. So that's another thing to put in your expectations. Yeah, you just look, it is it, not going to stay. Well. And you would think, you know, they're going to cater to those with the most points because other people are going to complain. I have 15 points and I still can't draw a tag. You know, they hear that year after year after year, the fishing game agencies are going to modify it to help those people who are waiting in line. But it's not. You look at Arizona and what they did, they took points out of that max point pool, put them into the general pool, which 10 years ago I would have been thrilled to death with. But I was sitting there getting close to that max point line where I could draw my tag. And now it added five to seven more years that I have to wait to draw that tag. After I'd already invested, I'd gotten to the point I was within a year of drawing the tag. They pull the carpet out from under me. Now I have to wait five to seven more years to benefit those with fewer points. But then you look at another state that 
I have few points in and they raise fees and limit the number of tags is the way that they deal with the issue. And it just, there is no win. Nobody's ever going to be happy with the point system. Well, I, a couple things I'll leave it with is I think you guys in Idaho have, have looked at it and you've done some things that help address some of the complaints. So the complaint is, oh, that SOB drew two moose tags in his lifetime or three sheep tags, whatever it is. So you guys have made those mm-hmm. once in a lifetime, right? So that gets rid of that rare occasion that is always the example people bellyache about. You've also said you got to decide if you're passionate about sheep or moose or goat. And if you're passionate about one of those three, you're, you're just going to go hunt general tags for deer and elk. So that's a way to address it. Uh, you, you're addressing it by saying, you know what, you're not going to draw in back-to-back years because if you drew a controlled hunt this year, you can't apply for the same controlled hunt type thing next year. So you can't draw it in back-to-back years. So a lot of these complaints that we often hear about, there are other ways to address them. And I think you guys in Idaho do a pretty good job of that without having to go to these elaborate point schemes. And it's going to, you know, next year with the limiting non-resident tags and increasing fees, that is how Idaho has chosen to respond to residents complaining about too many non-residents in the units they're hunting. And so um, it, it stinks. I'm a resident here and yeah, it'd be awesome to be able to go out in the woods and not see another hunter, but I understand the big picture and Unfortunately, the the squeaky wheel got loud enough this year that the fishing game had to do something, and there will be changes made next year that that will uh, discourage non residents from coming to Idaho. And it's uh, I don't know. I just think once we go down that road, it's it's like bonus points. We start limiting non residents more and more and more. It's I just don't see a happy ending for for hunters in general yeah well (laughs) i'm gonna get off my soapbox Corey, and hopefully people understand that just like them i share the same frustrations when i think this is my year i hope i sneak in and nobody sees this and poof someone some guy buying points for the last 20 years (laughs) jumps in and says i think i'd like that tag this year and i'm standing there with a long face but Oh, well, it's part of the game we play. Play games of chance, you know? You got to expect there's a lot of times that chance isn't going to be on your side. It's just like when you're standing there waiting in line for the Bon Jovi tickets and you think you're next and you're going to get those front row seats and all of a sudden here comes a guy that he was in the restroom and somebody was holding his place in line for him and he hits that last ticket. Bon who? (laughs) <laughs> I was trying to think of somebody you would recognize. I probably should have said Dwight Yoakam or Randy go. Travis. Or there something. you go. Now we're talking. Bon, uh, no. bon Jovi? <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. I don't know her. Never heard of her. <laughs> huh. uh, oh. Maybe maybe someday when I'm driving in your truck, you can put her on the jukebox and <laughs> who she is. Put in the eight track and there you go. You'll you'll recognize it, I'm sure. Well, I got an old Merle Merle Haggard eight track here that I took out of my dad's 1973 GMC. So, and uh, if you got a record player, I'll bring down a CW McCall vinyl that had Convoy on it. So. <laughs> There you go. There you go. And we are getting so far out in the weeds, Corey. I cannot believe anyone listens to this podcast. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that all three people who are hearing this part of it right now are thinking the same thing. Yeah, they're thinking, how did I ever get this board that I'd listen to these two jokers talk about? What's her name? Bon, bon Jovi? <laughs> bon, bon, whatever. Yeah. Uh, folks, All right. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully, there was uh, some worthwhile debate, some uh, valuable information, and as always, some invaluable nonsensical drivel that we seem to pad everything else and provide a buffer around the limited educational stuff we provide. But I'm just excited to be done officially now with application season and our talk of application 
uh, strategy on yeah. this podcast. We get into exciting things that are not negative, like Googling elk. And, and can yeah. I give a plug for a promotion we're getting ready to kick off at Elk 101? You knock yourself out, my friend. <laughs> Let's just say uh, by the time you listen to this podcast, we will be just about ready to launch it. So make sure you are on the Elk 101 email distribution list and uh, stay tuned for a really awesome opportunity to hunt elk this fall that we, uh, we're going to be talking about in the next day or two. Is, is in, in the fine print, does it say Fruit Loops from Bozeman, Montana are excluded? It doesn't. You know, you you excluded me from applying for any opportunity to go hunting with you, but I did not stoop that low. You're still welcome to apply. Well, I'll probably pass. I think folks would do. Oh, thanks a lot. I mean, these dudes deal from the bottom of the deck, man. <laughs> we could screw them into the ground. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, what, we've got a got an what, awesome, what, what uh, awesome promotion. This What's that? Where are they going to hear about this? Uh, we will be emailing out the official launch of the promotion on Tuesday, May 26th, so the day after Memorial Day. So we'll be uh, opening up the promotion then and we'll have some pretty awesome stuff tied in with University of Elk Hunting online course. Uh, we've teamed up with Mountain Ops for this promotion and uh, yeah. More details will be coming, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about it here on the podcast again. But just as a little teaser and to uh, stoke the fire a bit here, be sure you're on the Elk 101 email list and watch uh, Elk 101 social media and emails on Tuesday the 26th. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I'll, uh, I'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you – I'll I'll tell you what it is after we – Hang up the phone? Stop recording here. Yeah. Right. Oh, boy, do I got to pay extra for this? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you know, you're just going to get inundated with uh, messages and emails from people asking you to let them know what it is for the three days between when they hear this and when it actually comes out. Well, they can knock themselves out because if you message me on Facebook or Instagram, first of all, Facebook, I don't respond to them. Instagram, my social media group filters them and sends to me, Randy, this looks like one you might want to deal with. They said they went to high school with you. <laughs> they got bad stories to tell about me <laughs> so yeah i'm a hard guy to get a hold of actually so, not by design well kind of by design mostly because I, I don't want people to ridicule me about my bad spelling or something you know i'm an accountant <laughs> all right awesome. folks thanks for being here i hope yep. that on thursday morning by the time this podcast drops whenever this drops friday or whatever I hope that this week, all of our listeners have Wyoming elk tags in their pockets. Oh, yeah. I just, That'd be great. I just hope one of the co-hosts of this podcast has one in his pocket. Uh, me too. <laughs> I hope it's this, this co-host right here. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, too. I was hoping you draw a tag. And if I do, that'll just be bonus. There you go. Yeah. I, I like that. You know, my wife... <laughs> When my buddy Bart drew a sheep tag, she said, oh, well, he's deserving of that. And I look at her because it has the implication that I'm not deserving because I didn't draw. <laughs> and she looks at me like, yeah, what's your point, pal? So I'm sure if I asked my wife, she'd say, oh, Corey should draw. He's, he would be deserving of that is what she'd say. I would agree with her. All right. <laughs> let's stop. Let's stop. Uh, let's like <laughs> people go uh, <laughs> the people who haven't hung up yet <laughs> folks thanks for listening right, folks. we'll catch you on the next one and randy good luck with the wyoming draw thanks Corey. same to you all right